The joy of the Lord is our strength. God wants us to be strong. Why? Because it's time. It's not later, it's now. I'm not waiting, it's already here. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Now's the time. Why would now be the time? Because Jesus said in John 4, verse 35, don't say it's four months later down the road until harvest comes. Now is the time of harvest. What are you waiting for? God wants to do a mighty work now, not later, not tomorrow. He wants to bring revival now, not later, now. Why? Because it's harvest time. Disciples didn't understand what he was doing in Samaria, especially talking to a woman, especially that kind of woman, one with five husbands, and now she's living with a man she's not even married to. What in the world is he doing? They're worried about lunch. They're out buying groceries. They're shopping at harvest for the precious meat. <laughs> worried about, man, like I said, fried chicken. Worried about was for lunch. And Jesus understood what time it was. Harvest time. Do you even understand what time it is? Oh. I heard this week from a pastor who was one of our assistant, assistant district superintendent Assemblies of God in one of our states and he's been in ministry for 38 years. He's not someone without integrity and history and the lady came to him that's not even from his church, started a business she had about the church. And the church last month saw, I believe it was 78 people that one month saved and just some amazing things. But so he had and felt so in the spirit that was from God that he asked her to come this past Sunday and share it. So she shared the vision with the church. He got up intending just to take the offer after she was done. And still when he opened his mouth, the spirit of prayer and intercession for the lost came upon him. And for about 15 minutes, all he could do was pray and intercede for the lost. The congregation, of course, joining in. And then for about 25 minutes, all he could do was prophesy to the congregation the prophetic word of the Lord. And it was all said and done. 23 people came forward to be saved. before he returns. The only reason the Bible says that he tarries his coming is he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the only reason the father holds back from saying, son, go get my children, is because he hates for anybody to be left behind. Unfortunately, when it's all said and done, there will be those left behind, but we can make a difference and make it less than what it will be as we open our hearts and let Jesus be all that he wants to be on the inside of us. Fill us with his joy. Deliver us from depression. Deliver us from being oppressed. Deliver us from bondages. Deliver us from going around the same mountains, dealing with the same hang-ups, dealing with the same tragedies, dealing with the same things that have held us year after year, month after month, week after week. God wants you to be free so that you can stand over the pit of hell and literally with the authority of Jesus drag people out before they go in. Keep them out of the line. fighting with our husbands and wives, quit fighting with other church members, quit fighting with people from other churches and join together and bind together and say, now's the time. God is moving now. You know what he's doing? He's pouring out. God said, I will pour out. You know, all he needs to pour out is a vessel to pour in. God won't waste anything. So when he says, in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. And then Peter says in Acts chapter 2, Joel prophesied that, and Peter said, this is that 
He has spoken by the prophet Joel, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. He prophesies of pouring out in the last days. We're living in those days. Last days, last harvest. And why did Jesus say he would pour out his spirit in Acts 1 and 8? He said, you'll receive the pouring out of the Holy Spirit to do what? To sit on it, to have goosebumps, to just shout and scream and holler and roll the floor in church? No, all those things may happen because when he pours out his spirit, I mean, your emotions and your flesh can't help but react in some way. For some of you, it may be quiet tears. For some of you, it may be collapsing in his presence. For others of you, it may be doubling over as he hits you right in your gut, your belly. Some of you don't understand sometimes why you feel something hitting you in your belly. Well, the Bible says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. You know where your spirit is? It's right there in your belly. So sometimes the reason when you open your heart and God hits you in the gut, that's because that's where your belly is. That's where your spirit is. But that's not the point. Why does he do it? I'll pour my spirit out on you to give you power to be my witnesses. Amen. Now is the time, not later. Now is the time that God is pouring out. But all that he needs to be able to pour out is somebody to pour in. Somebody who's opened up and said, God, pour into me. I'm not going to worry about if I act like Pastor Ronnie a little bit crazy. I'm not going to worry about if I act like that lady across the aisle that's really crazy. <coughs> I'm just going to open up and let you do something with me. Some of you would find that you'll get rid of that depression if you open up. Some of you will find you'll look forward to tomorrow if you'll open up. It's not just about what God does to deliver you. It's about what God does in you to use you for this last day harvest. So he says, I'm pouring out, but I need something to pour in. First of all, he needs those who are completely empty, but are also completely open. So you're here tonight, you're completely empty because you're not right with God, period. There's unconfessed sin in your life. What does that mean? That means there's ongoing sin in your heart that you haven't truly repented of. That doesn't mean, Jesus, forgive me, but you don't purpose in your heart to turn and go the opposite direction. But re truly repented sin means... Jesus, forgive me, and I purpose in my heart now to turn my back on that and go the opposite direction. And I ask you to fill me with the power of Christ to change me so that I can go that opposite direction. Does that mean I always get it right and don't make a mistake and fall? No, but my heart is right. And so some of you need to come clean with God and completely empty out by completely being open. Saying, Jesus, I am a sinner. I mean, we can't play church and pretend we're okay if we're not okay. You can't carry on an affair and pretend to be saved and, and expect God to bless you. What's done in the closet will be announced on the rooftop. By the way, the affair would never happen if you would shut down the flirting when it starts. Amen. Well, that's good preaching. <laughs> Or you can sneak around when your wife's not around and look at the porn. And you expect to be blessed of God, your family blessed, your house blessed. Come clean. I'm addicted. There's an addiction. Sure, you're addicted. Because there's a spirit behind that. A spirit of perversion and boredoms behind that. That spirit now has a hold of you. You are bound. There's freedom in Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. If you would just simply completely open up, as you have been now made completely empty by the sin in your heart, He'll set you free. Amen. He'll pour out on you power to make you different. Yes. Yes. Sin in your heart, come clean. Run to Jesus. Some of you are prodigals. You've been running the opposite direction and just waiting. 
What are you waiting for? Oh, I gotta get it all right. You know, get all my. No, run to him like you are. Completely empty, but completely open. Let him cleanse you. Then it's also for the believer. Sin's gone. You're forgiven. You're not perfect, but you're forgiven. But you're emptied out. See, even we as believers have to empty out of stuff that's not necessarily sin, but it's taken the majority of our life. Notice, I told you the story in John chapter 4. The disciples were focused on the meal. Well, there's nothing wrong with eating. Thank God. Amen? But it was harvest time. I mean, this lady was getting and she was going to get the whole village. The whole village was coming to know God. They were worried about, is it McDonald's or Burger King? Where are we going to eat? You see what I'm saying? We, what God wants us, us as believers is to empty out of the stuff that makes us too stuffed to have any room for Him to pour in. In the last days, I will pour out. What's he looking for? Vessels to pour in. But if you're all full and stuff of stuff that has no bearing on eternity, then he has no room to pour into you. And by the way, some of you aren't stuffed with stuff just of this world. You're stuffed with lies from the enemy, insecurity, doubt, fear, anger, unforgiveness. You're stuffed with pain from your past, from abuse. And from things that went wrong, from abandonment. You're stuffed with all this stuff that's happened to you and didn't go right. And disappointment and your focus is what God didn't do. We talked about that Sunday instead of what he has done. And what God wants you to do is just simply empty out. How do I do that? Confess the things that are stuffing you right now. Whether it's busyness with this world of things that are not necessarily wrong, but they just have you overflowing and there's no room for really God. Or if it's stuff that the enemy's cramming down your throat that you know is hindering to you. Come on, open up. Release those things. Confess those things to God and say, help me get rid of it. Empty out so you can pour in. Come on, he's pouring out right now. He's just looking for vessels that are open. He'll pour out if you're available to pour into. And the last thing that happens when that begins to happen, we get right, we empty out and let him pour in, is that there are new vessels for him to pour into. <laughs> the woman went and got the whole village. They said, now we believe not because you told us, but we've heard him for ourselves. You told us why, because something happened in you. <clears throat> we knew if it could happen to you, it was to you. If it happened to you, then oh, surely we've heard it for ourselves. Now we believe. And so when new vessels come, it, it causes God to continue to just pour out. See, God isn't looking for this to be a blessed club. He isn't looking for us to repeat the same ones always in the altar receiving, though you can never get too much. Hit the altar every service. Good for you. But you know what He wants? Pour into you and to fill you so full that He's bringing in new vessels because we're letting Him use us so you can be poured out through you onto others. Yes, yes. You still with me? Say big amen. amen. Go to 2 Kings real quickly. Chapter 4. And then we're going to close. 2 Kings, many of you will remember the story and it just illustrates everything I've just said. Pour out. Everybody say pour out. Pour out. 2 Kings 4 verse 1. One day the widow of one of Elisha's fellow prophets came to Elisha and cried out to him, My husband who served you as dead, and you know how he feared the Lord. But now creditors come threatening to take my two sons as slaves. What we don't understand is that if God doesn't pour out, it will affect the generation that is right behind us. It will affect your children. There, 
is a lot at stake. If we don't have a real revival, it will affect the generation that is back there.